Well, that was a beautiful unity song. I like that word in there, in that song. Um, for our, for thought this morning, um, I found a little uh, poem. Um, it's from Fatty Judah's book, A Light. Um, he is a Palestinian American and um, he's worked with, he's a physician, he's worked with Doctors Without Borders and, and um, he's also a poet and writes little, writes books uh, with beautiful poetry. Um, this one is called My Mamsis uh, and it goes like this. My daughter wouldn't hurt a spider that had nested between her bicycle handles. For two weeks she waited until it left of its own accord. If you tear down the web, I said, it will simply know this isn't a place to call home and you'll get to go biking. She said, that's how others become refugees, isn't it? Well, I forgot to mention, but I'm sure you've all already turned off your phones or uh, put them in airplane mode or such things. <laughs> um, but if you do that, that helps our folks on, on Zoom, please. So do we have any announcements this morning? We can start with the Zoom people. See lots of Zoom interest there. We'd love to hear from you. Here in the room, any announcements? Mary Dooley here. Um, I just wanted to share with you, I have a conflict. Do I go to dancing tonight or do I watch this film? <laughs> <laughs> Tough choice. Uh, there's a film, um, it's a free screening event that you might be interested in. Uh, uh, the film is John Lewis, Good Trouble. It'll be online, and um, I'll leave this little descriptor on the table if, if you want to look at it for more information. But it's um, being hosted by the Declaration for American Democracy Coalition. De uh, Declaration for American Democracy Coalition. Uh, it's um, a project of Fix Democracy First yeah, their Meaningful Movies project, and it's from 7 to 9 tonight. It's a virtual event, so and it's free, so, and it looks very good. Hi, I'm Rhonda M. Pink, and next Saturday, May 4th, there'll be um, a retreat that is for representatives from six different meetings that have been working with Colin Sexton and Scott Wagner over the past nine months, talking about what it is they can do in the future for their meetings. And for some of them, it was you know talking about laying down their meetings. But for others, it was, what are we going to do in the future? And uh, we're talking about that as a possibility uh, we talked about it last week at the monthly meeting for business, and we've been invited to send a couple representatives, if we want to, to hear what they've been doing in those um, sessions. And uh, Lynn DeRocher and myself will be going. We could take one or two other people if you'd like to uh, go. Please see me. I want to contact them early in the week to let them know if we're going to have how many people we're going to have. Uh, this is, I think, an interesting opportunity. It, when I heard about some of what they were doing, it reminded me of what we did 10 years ago with the Looking Forward Committee. Thank you. Oh, I just want to say yesterday it was great at, I don't know if you were going to say anything, but we went down to the Peace March and Rally, and I think we had about 20 people from, Fairfield, and 
what was interesting is that it was the first time the young people organized it, so there were a lot of young people. But then there was this older group <laughs> from Fairfield. And, and, and the, this, this shows you how interesting times have changed. Usually you sign up with your name on a clipboard, you know, that you were there. Yesterday you had to scan the, the barcode with your phone and then fill out the information. And I bet you they're going to be wondering why there were so many people from Hendricks County. <laughs> Thank you. This is Lynn Adams, and <clears throat> I'm in charge, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm in charge of the sound and everything today. Lee is gone, so it's taken um, Scott and Bill and me to try to figure out what we're doing here. And um, so I apologize to Zoom that we don't have um, the pictures like we usually do. He's, Lee showed me how I could get the Zoom in on people talking, but I tried, I can't do it. So we will be glad to have Lee back next week, but I'm sorry that at least we got something up that they can see. <laughs> Um, the meeting has signed a letter of intent with the town of Plainfield that will move us forward with the 1892 church. And so um, I'll be sending out an email sometime this week uh, to try and form a committee to start moving forward. Um, some of the committee's things might be to visit the old building before it goes away. And uh, other things might be to talk about some kind of a monument that might be placed Plainfield's willing to fund a, a monument of some sort that could be in the, in the roundabout um, and could commemorate the, the building. It's up to the committee to decide what they want to do. So uh, watch out for that email. And if you want to volunteer for it, I'd, I'll take all kinds of volunteers, please. Thank you. I'm Rita Goss, and I'm sure um, most of you have seen the bags of toys that we have hanging out for the, the children to have. Um, I just, I've had a ball putting that together, but I don't want to hog all the fun. So I bought some extra bags. If you're out and you see something that you think the kids would like to have to play with during church, I've got the bags there in the office. We'll we'll get them put out and if we get to the point where we have an overload we'll take some of them out and just switch them around different weeks so have a good time I'll add one little announcement. Um, the, um, the everybody can discern themselves how to um, help sustain the, the meeting by leaving a check in the offering plate if you're if that works for you, or go online and uh, learn where to mail donations or how um, through whatever means works for you. So um, we'll not be passing the plates around, but. Uh, that is certainly available and, and needed to sustain the meeting. O oh God, we gather together today with expectant and yearning hearts, ever mindful of the brokenness in our world and the suffering we encounter ourselves and see in others. We pray, O oh God, for courage and for love 
and for patience. We pray for the ultimate victory of justice and charity and goodwill. We remember especially this morning the people of Gaza and the brokenness and pain they experience. We remember also the people of Israel bound to a history which still beleaguers them, frightens them, and makes them all the more determined that it did not happen again. Oh God, spare us from fears which cause us to hate, troubles which cause us to lose hope. Place in our hearts a love for one another, those like us and especially those not like us. May our love for you and for this wonderful world and everyone in it be extravagant and generous and transformative. This is our prayer this first day morning. Amen. Well, now we will gather up our food for the hungry. We need some strong people who can pull a basket, pick up a basket and pull a wagon. Where is the wagon? Oh, right there. Well, I was sitting in the kitchen last week and a friend of mine called on my phone asking if he could borrow our Ford Flex. He didn't say why he needed it and I didn't want to appear nosy because if there's one thing I'm not, it's nosy. <laughs> so I just said, sure, use it as long as you need to, come get it. And a bit later, I was looking out the window, the kitchen window, and I saw him hurrying up our driveway, 
glancing all around, scurrying along the way you do when you've broken something and want to get away quickly before someone notices. I could tell just by the way he was walking and looking around that he didn't want to talk with me. But later that day, I was at Larry's uh, gas station there in Danville getting the oil changed in our other car, and I noticed my friend's car up on the lift being worked on. There were a bunch of mechanics standing around it, um, and I knew it was serious because they were looking at their service manuals, and you know how messed up something has to be for men to look at directions. <laughs> And even though it was none of my business, I asked Larry uh, what was wrong with my friend's car, and he just shook his head and said, everything that could possibly be wrong with a car is wrong with that car. It is the worst vehicle ever made. And I was surprised to hear Larry say that because my friend was always bragging about his car saying it was the best car he had ever owned, urging me to buy one just like it, that I wouldn't regret it. A few days later, my friend brought our car back, and before I could even ask him about his car, he started talking about my car. He said, I didn't know you had that many miles on your car. You ought to sell it while it's still worth something and buy a car like mine. It's the best car I've ever had. I didn't tell him I'd seen his car at Larry's. For the same reason, I don't tell Jehovah Witnesses they're wacky when they knock on my door. Once someone is convinced they found the perfect car, the true religion, the honest politician, there's no dissuading them. We've been talking about the importance of acknowledging our missteps, of those moments in Quaker history that in hindsight weren't so bright. Uh, we friends are eager often to applaud the virtues of our spiritual ancestors, and they did many things well, but it's just as important to be mindful of our historical shortcomings so we don't repeat them. Healthy religions are never afraid of scrutiny. And so we've called this sermon series, What in the World Were We Thinking? One of Quakerism's historical errors was assuming that because we found meaning and purpose in silence, everyone else would too. Uh, not unlike my friend who, convinced he'd found the perfect car, wanted everyone else to buy one too. But just because something works for us doesn't mean it works for everyone. In 1829, Quakers in Philadelphia, wanting to rehabilitate inmates, designed a prison, the Eastern State Penitentiary, which would isolate inmates, removing them from each other's negative influences. Friends believed that silence and isolation would help inmates reflect on their lives and inspire them to change their ways. Because silence had been helpful to us, we believed it would be good for everyone. Unfortunately, it turned out that solitary confinement had a catastrophic effect on some inmates, driving them to insanity and even suicide. It didn't occur to us that what felt like a blessing to us might be a burden for others. Our biases, when imposed on others, always exact a toll. When my grandfather was 13, his father went to his school one day and 
checked him out of school for good and sent him to work in a factory. His father had done the same thing to him and he told my grandfather, be glad you don't have to go to school anymore. It's a waste of time. But all it did for my grandfather was make him sad because he loved school and wanted nothing more to attend college, which he finally did at the age of 62 after the factory he worked in closed. But he never forgot his life from the age of 14 to 62, which he referred to as his wasted years. Never forget that what feels like a blessing to us might to others be a burden. Believing the best way to discover meaning and purpose was to sit silently. It didn't occur to those Pennsylvania friends that other people might find meaning and purpose in music, in art, in literature, in nature, in human intimacy, in friendships, in travel, in work, and God forbid, even sacraments. It never occurred to them. The presumption that just because something works well for us, it will surely work well for others is still a common misperception. I was talking with my younger brother this week trying to persuade him. He's 61 years old. He spent his entire life living in an apartment in the city. And I found myself telling him that if he really wanted to be happy, he needed to buy a farm in the country. <laughs> Years ago, I had a Quaker minister friend who had been a pastoral minister for close to 20 years. And he, uh, in a meeting with his fellow ministers, announced that he was leaving pastoral ministry, that he was uh, going to uh, become a doctor, go to medical school and become a doctor. And of course, we could not wait for him to leave the gathering so we could talk about him behind his back, which we did. We all agreed he was making a huge mistake because he was a really good pastor. And besides, he was too old to start over that he wouldn't like it. And we predicted his ruination. But he applied to medical school to our shock was accepted and became a doctor anyway, as it turns out, an excellent physician. I was talking with a mutual friend not long ago about him. I said, you know, I bet he wishes he were still a Quaker pastor. And our friend said, you know, I don't think so. I see him pretty regularly, and he really loves being a doctor. Of course, I was sad to hear that. <laughs> I hate it when people enjoy things I think uh, they shouldn't. I had a friend, Jerry. He's one of my best friends. He lives down the street from me. I called him last week, and the background on the phone sounded very unfamiliar. And I said, where in the world are you? He said, I took my daughter, and we went to Las Vegas. I said, are you crazy, Las Vegas? You're going to get hooked on gambling. You're going to hang out with the wrong kind of people. You're going to ruin your life. You need to come home immediately. But they didn't. They stayed there for three extra days. And then he came home. I saw him. I said, how did you? How was your time in Las Vegas? He said, oh, it was wonderful. We had a great time. But I know he's lying. <laughs> and that they'll die and go to hell. I just know it. <laughs> of course, something else might happen. I might learn that just because I fear something doesn't mean everyone else should. I might learn that what makes me happy might make someone else miserable. I might learn that the very thing that sets me free 
might feel like chains to another. How much lovelier our world would be, how much happier we all would be if we each, each of us followed our high and holy leadings and were content to let others follow theirs. Well, last night I did the very thing I cautioned you not to do in my sermon this morning. I read the bulletin to see what we would be singing, and I thought that since I didn't like that song, no one else would either. <laughs> and so I texted Cynthia, and I said, Cindy, we need another hymn to finish. And she said, are you going to pick it, or would you like me to pick it? And I said, I trust you, Cindy. And she has picked a song for us to sing, and we've never sang it before. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Come, come on up and tell us how we're going to do this. Verse number 222. 222. In the Green Book. Love. 
16 bit. Well, this must be the Sunday for good things to say about Catholics. <laughs> Remember hearing a story about a man named Henry Nowen, who was a famous, famous writer, and at the peak of his career moved to a group home in Canada to care for developmentally disabled children and adults. And people would sometimes learn that this renowned man was there and they would travel to this place and seek him out. And one day a man went and he looked all over the building and couldn't find him and couldn't find him. And then he needed to go to the restroom and he went and there was a man kneeling underneath a urinal cleaning the floor. And he asked the man, he's supposed to be a janitor, where is Henry now? And and the man said, I'll be right with you. And he said this, for Jesus, there are no countries to be conquered, no ideologies to be imposed, no people to be dominated. There are only children, men, and women to be loved. So there's our goal, to go out in this world and to find children and men and women to be loved. Turn and greet friends. <laughs> <laughs>